Hi, I'm Candace McAlia, and if you're anything like me, you are sick and tired of hearing about the city election. All of the backbiting, the he said, she said. So you'll be happy to know on this edition of Politically Personal, we are not going to talk about the issues, but we are going to talk with one of the candidates running for city commission and give you some insight into the person behind the politician. Let's get personal with Richard Dorfman. have a really cool and eclectic art collection going on in here. Um, tell me about your art and what inspires you, what you like. I went through a lot of lot of different periods of, of what I liked and I've, I've settled now on sort of pop art and graffiti art and urban art and stuff like that. And uh, you know the whole the whole place is filled with Warhol and Wesselman and Lichtenstein and, and uh, this piece um, I'm a I'm a Marilyn Monroe freak. I have a lot of Obviously. a lot of Marilyn Monroe <laughs> pieces, but this I saw at the it was a, it's a very famous um, uh, exhibition called the the Freeze Exhibition in London, and I saw it from across the room and I thought it was a photograph. Me too. That's what I thought when I first came in. Yeah, everybody does. Yeah. And then as I got closer and closer, I said, "Holy moly, that's a painting! This is incredible." He lives right on the Sarasota Bayfront in a super cool pad filled with great artwork, guitars, and a killer view. But this Sarasota City Commission candidate started life out simpler. I was born in uh, in New York, New York City, in Queens, and um, my parents divorced when I was about four or five years old, and my mother and stepfather ended up moving out um, out into the suburbs. And we moved to a little town in northern New Jersey called Upper Saddle River, okay. which was uh, about as big as a whisper. The home I grew up in was built in the 1750s. Wow. So um, I guess I grew up with a real appreciation in neighborhoods and community and this sort of small town sort of ethic. You know, July 4th, we all went to the fire department for the pancake breakfast and Memorial Day, we all marched in the parade and uh, you played Little League baseball and Little League football. I mean, it was it was about as uh, Norman Rockwell as you could get. Went to high school in, in, uh, in, Ju in New Jersey and then um, was accepted to college in American University. I, I, um, I was playing soccer in, in high school and some other sports, but I ended up playing ball at, at American University. I played soccer and rugby there. And, um, and it was amazing going from this real small town existence, though we were only about 30 miles from Manhattan, you know, we were in the woods, it was all farmland. And then all of a sudden you're in, in Washington DC in the 70s in the heart of the beast during the Vietnam era and it was like, what an eye opener. It was amazing, just an incredible time to be in the nation's capital. I majored in business and communications there and um, majored in fun, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> as one <Yeah>. does. <laughs> right after graduation working for um, the Washington Diplomats, which was the pro soccer team there as their PR director. And then ended up moving to New York and um, you know started, started my career in New York with the Cosmos soccer team at the time, which was amazing because they had this incredible roster of stars, Pelé and Franz Beckenbauer and you know all these legendary people that I grew up just, you know, they were my heroes as a soccer player. All of a sudden I'm on the plane with these guys riding to games and producing all the broadcasts and everything else. It was like a dream come true. And they paid me for this. It was incredible. The mid to late 70s and the early 80s, we were at Studio 54 every night and Andy Warhol and, and you know, Mick Jagger, everybody was there. Ahmed Erdogan, the founder of Atlantic Records, actually was, um, you know, he owned the Cosmos. Warner Communications owned it, but Ahmet and his brother Nesawi were the guys who started it. So it was like, holy moly, you're just... And that's what I say, I've just been so blessed being around these people and I ended up going from the Cosmos to becoming director of broadcasting of the NBA. Really that was when the NBA was starting, to, it, Larry O'Brien was still the commissioner but David Stern who's the current commissioner, we were starting to turn the NBA around is when Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson came in and uh, the whole flavor of the NBA started to turn. So again it was at a real seminal time for this league and being part of that was fantastic. And then work landed him a great gig in London. Ended up working for the company that represented all the rights for Rugby World Cup. And in 1991 we did, it was the second Rugby World Cup, we did it in, in the UK. But in 1995 the Rugby World Cup was awarded to South Africa. 
and that's when things really started to pop. I mean, that's when things really got exciting. You know, South Africa had just just come out of apartheid. They hadn't hadn't been any international sporting competition. They were shunned by the rest of the world. And uh, Nelson Mandela had just become president. I mean, th this is a once in a lifetime, once in three lifetime experiences. So for the next four years, from 1991 to 1995, I was commuting back and forth between, um, between South Africa and London. And I was also doing um, something called the All Africa Games in Zimbabwe. But once Mandela, Mandela got involved with it, and he said, this is the way we're going to bring the country together. And what he did was, at the start of the first game, he took the rugby jersey of Francois Pinard, the captain, and he put it on. And he started dancing with the team, you know, before the first game. And, I mean, it, it can't be more storybook. You were there. I was there. I was on the sidelines. We were, I, you know, I was, I was their agent. I handled all of their broadcasting. Don't you know South Africa beats the current world champions in the first game of the World Cup? And that set the tone for the entire tournament. I am telling you, this entire country, black, white, gray, blue, was galvanize the place was electric what amazed me about him is after the absolute hell he has been through and everything else his love for his fellow man never diminished but the thing that that was so it just left an indelible mark on me is his sheer force of will mm. you know he knew through everything he was going to succeed and there was no stopping him and when you're in his presence you feel it and, and there have been very, very few people in my lives who you actually get that kind of vibe from. You get different vibes. But the power in, in Nelson Mandela, the sheer force of will, you know, this sort of energy that emanates from him, I mean, it knocks you flat on your back. You are in awe. A meeting that he says shaped his life, a life he calls blessed, especially since he ended up here. You've got a million things you can do to Sarasota, and we sort of do them all. I like to play a lot of sports. We play golf. I work out a lot. We run the bridge. Um, I love playing my guitars. You know, we, we hang out on the, on the balcony and play guitar and have a cocktail in the water. There's nothing better than that. <laughs> I started playing when I was about 15 or 16, and like everybody who took up the guitar back in high school, you, you took it up because you wanted to get girls. <laughs> that was the idea. So I, I took up the guitar. Did it work? Um, I probably should have practiced more <laughs> on the guitar and the girls. <laughs> You could say he did pretty well, ending up with girlfriend Suzette Jones, his partner in all things fun, and his number one campaign volunteer. A long campaign that's about to enter its final phase. Where if we go one way, Sarasota will sort of languish. It won't move forward. And if we go the other way, we're really going to push the boundaries of our greatness. We will become... We're not going to become better because Sarasota is, I mean, it doesn't get any better than Sarasota, but we can become a great city. The Sarasota city election is on May 14th, and for more information about Richard and his campaign, you can go to electdorfman.com.